Good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, those of you who've been here to previous lectures will know that we, over a series of about six or seven lectures, cover many aspects of Parkinson's disease. And tonight I wanted to talk about one of the uh, areas which I think is very important in Parkinson's but often not talked much about, and that is the complications that come in the later stage of Parkinson's disease. So um, uh, I hope you all paid attention to my viewers' advisory warning that uh, a bit like the television have up about these problems and um, because there will be the lectures directed at the late stage of Parkinson's and it can be quite confronting to talk about some of the issues that occur in the later stage of the disease. So again, those of you who've been here before will know how we've divided Parkinson's broadly up into... Um, Parkinson's is divided up, or broadly we can think of it in three stages and these timelines on the top are very arbitrary because um, people can live with Parkinson's for 30 to 35 years and other people will live with it for uh, five or six years. But if we look at the literature and say what's the median time that people take to go through these stages, these are the representative figures. So um, again, I don't want anyone to think that um, six years is up, I must move on. <laughs> It's really more a painting of what the overall picture of the disease looks like. The first stage is pretty simple. There's few disabilities and the medications work well. In the second stage, there are fluctuations in the motor symptoms. And again, this part of the disease is really about movement and the problems of movement and the effect of the treatment. And then the, later, the last stage, is characterised by this problem of postural instability and falls, problems with neuropsychiatry, particularly hallucinations, and problems with cognitive function. And the bridging problems often relate to these issues of impulsive behaviour, depression and anxiety, sleep disturbance and autonomic failure. So you'll see that this is the motor components which Parkinson's everyone talks about, the tremor, the slowness of movements, but much of the illness is uh, characterised by these areas which actually don't really relate to movement. Now, I can't cover, cover all of them tonight, so I've picked out the ones which I think um, present the biggest problems and often are not explained as well or understood as well. So. Apologies that we haven't had a sweeping coverage of the whole field, but I thought it was better to pick on a smaller amount and do it in a bit more detail. I'm going to start with um, falls first of all. And the most important aspect to indicate that falls are going to be a problem in this condition called freezing of gait. Now this terminology is a bit confusing because sometimes people use freezing to represent when their medications don't work and they become slower. But what we actually refer to freezing is this condition here. So you can see this, we've deliberately put up this obstacle course and so he gets stuck at particular places where his feet don't move fluently and then he's stuck again and stuck again and that Repetitive moving with the feet stuck on the, pot, on the floor, sometimes called magnetic foot, is what's represented by freezing of gait. And once that becomes a problem, then almost always it's followed by falling. And at present we don't really know how to stop this. There's a few ideas that might occur, but um, it often is associated with changing in dec or declining cognitive function as well. And we think that it might be related, that the two are related. Often at this same time, and we can pick this up earlier, is what's called loss of postural reflexes. And this is the fourth big sign of Parkinson's. There's tremor, slowness of movement, stiffness when we move the limbs, and this problem of postural reflexes. So the way we teach medical students what it is, is that we stand behind the patient, give them a brisk tug to their shoulders, and if you haven't got Parkinson's and your balance is good, 
you might take a bit of a sway or one step back and that's it. But someone with Parkinson's disease and an increasing problem with posture is going to go back and, and go stepping quickly back and that quickly lose their balance and you can see that this problem of falling backwards is, will rapidly follow this loss of postural reflex. We also know that these involuntary movements that commonly occur in Parkinson's, if they're severe enough, can knock someone off balance, particularly if they have other problems with uh, uh, balance control. A fourth reason why people have falls is low blood pressure. Their blood pressure drops and they can black out and then fall because of it. I'm going to talk about this point in more detail shortly. Then People with Parkinson's can have a whole lot of other illnesses which have got nothing to do with Parkinson's. Unfortunately, it doesn't exempt you from these problems. And so people with Parkinson's can have bad hips and bad backs and bad knees and all the reasons why people without Parkinson's can fall as well. We also know that this condition of impulsivity, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what I mean by that, but it, this is the problem which can be a bigger issue in Parkinson's where if the doorbell rings, you, you're up and heading off for the doorbell without thinking about it, and if your balance is no good, then you're halfway there without your stick, and then you're more likely to have a fall. And that compounds all of the other problems of balance. And I've put pride down because it's an important factor which needs to be talked about in terms of preventing falls and that is that people are slow to use sticks and walking frames and because it seems to be that they're losing the battle with the illness and they don't want to be seen as old. But actually sticks are your pathway to freedom. If you can keep using walking aids, you can go out, you can keep doing more and it gives you a far greater degree of independence. And people who are late in using sticks have a greater incidence of falls. Now, why do we worry about falls? Well, firstly, if you fall over and you've got poor balance and you've got poor motor control, you can't get up by yourself. So you need then someone to help you get up. And if your carer has had too many birthdays as well, they may not be able to actually help you stand up and get your balance as well. But really the reason we worry about it is that if you fall and break a big bone, you never get back to where you were before. And disability is substantial. Even if you break a neck of femur, a, a neck of the humerus up here, this bit, you may have trouble looking after yourself at the toilet or having a shower because you've only got one hand and you can't do the same things. Dressing is difficult with only one arm that works. If you lose your hip, apart from the disability that comes with the pain, surgery and s severe Parkinson's at this stage don't mix very well and people lose a lot of ground in cognitive function just by having the anaesthetic. It's a major setback and, and one that we really try and avoid as much as possible. So I mentioned those, these I've got ahead of my slides here. And I want to stress here, and I'm going to come back to this point as well, the reasons people lose independence with Parkinson's, that is that they go into institutions that give dependent care, that i.e. you can't stay at home, are usually one of these, a uh, combination of these four factors. Falls, cognition, the health of your partner, and continence. Now, you can usually stay at home with one, you might be able to stay at home with two, but you can never stay at home with three. Well, I shouldn't say never, but you need to have a very large cheque account to actually have, be able to pay for the carers. So it's really, it, if you think about trying to avoid these problems by looking at factors that stop falling and actively participating, it's a major step forward to avoiding the loss of independence. So the next thing I wanted to talk about, and I'm going to go through these points and we, um, I'm happy to be interrupted for questions, but we, I sh I'm hoping I'm going to leave enough time at the end to also talk about questions. 
is to talk about a condition called the autonomic function. Now if we talk about years of time going by, and this is the diagnosis, we often find that people have had symptoms of motor or movement problems some years before they get diagnosed. And with most of these, we also find that there are features suggesting that there, these aspects, autonomic function, sleep, cognition and neuropsychiatry, not so much, but these four, are present prior to diagnosis. Now what we mean by autonomic function is the autonomic system, amongst other things, controls blood pressure, bowel function, body temperature and sweating. And constipation is one of the very early features of Parkinson's and many people will say that constipation started five to ten years before the, Parkinson, before the Parkinson's was diagnosed. But these other factors such as blood pressure and body temperature and sweating, sometimes they're present at the outset of the illness but often they don't start till five or six to ten years in. I'll come back to each of these in a detail, but I wanted to first of all talk about low blood pressure. Now, when everything's working properly, if this is a measure of your blood pressure over time, so this is the level when you're lying flat, your blood pressure is at a good constant level, and if you were to stand up, without an autonomic nervous system, the blood pressure would fall, and you wouldn't have enough blood to the brain. Now the brain needs a constant blood supply and so you would, there would be symptoms of low blood pressure. But fortunately we have reflexes which rapidly either prevent or reverse this problem so that you can stand up without hardly ever having symptoms of low blood pressure. Occasionally, particularly on a hot day, if you haven't kept up with the fluids and you've bent down to do something, you might stand up and get a bit of a head spin. But that's really about the most of it. But if for some reason these reflexes in here which control the blood pressure supply are damaged, then what would happen is that you'd be in the same situation as this person and you'd be prone to falling because of the low blood pressure. And all of these things can damage the reflexes. Parkinson's itself, Parkinson's drugs, diabetes, which people with Parkinson's often have, and also blood pressure drugs. So if you've already been treated for high blood pressure and then you develop problems with the autonomic nervous system, you can have a competition between the two drugs. So I've alluded to some of the symptoms of low blood pressure. The most common is lightheadedness when you stand up. And sometimes, mostly when things are working well and you haven't got Parkinson's, people recognise those that symptom. But if you've had a chronically low blood pressure, that is that your blood pressure goes low a lot of the time, you actually end up not being able to recognise that very well and you end up with a fuzzy headedness and confused. And these can occur when you stand up, but they can also occur at other times when blood is needed elsewhere. And when you have a meal, blood is shunted away and sent to the gut to digest your meal. And a particularly vulnerable time is at breakfast when you're a bit low on fluid because you haven't drunk all night and you've probably been up to the toilet a fair bit. And then you take your medications which are going to lower the blood pressure a little bit more and then you have a meal which is going to shunt the blood away and often that results in people what we call greying out and not really looking like they're present and uh, not being able to concentrate on what's being said to them. It's also not uncommon to end up passing a lot of urine at night and the reason for this is that the arteries that go to the kidney, even though the kidneys are down here, they actually start up surprisingly high up here. And so if you're standing up with a low blood pressure, the kidneys aren't getting a very much perfusion during the day and so they don't make very much urine. And so this gets stored up during the daytime. You then lie down flat and the pressure to the kidneys go up and away they go and make more and more urine and so someone's up all the night getting rid of what that's been made 
and then when they get up in the morning they're a bit low on volume and in trouble again. And we've mentioned the falls and the blackouts which can occur. Now, there's a few things I need to say about low blood pressure. It's very unpredictable. It doesn't happen every time you stand up. And so when you go to the doctors and they measure your blood pressure sitting and they say stand up, it may not drop much at all. And similarly, you might be able to walk around and do things and not have any symptoms of blood pressure for most of the day, but then every now and then you get it once every second day or third day and then the symptoms occur. It's also likely to be more of a problem when you have to stand for a long period of time. So um, standing in a queue, um, often people find it when they go to church, they stand up for a long period of time there and that uh, sends, uh, seems to, because they're having to stand up and down a few times. And so it's difficult to make the diagnosis by necessarily measuring the blood pressure because you've got to be there at the time to measure the change. And so a lot of the times we have to do it on symptoms or best guess. Now this is an example that I wanted to show you from a, a device that we use for measuring um, sleep as well as Parkinson's movement. And so this, is re this person we recorded from midnight to midnight for five days and every time the line goes, goes black this person was effectively asleep. So you can see that they didn't sleep well that night, got up at about five o'clock, had their medications and then went to sleep again for a short period of time and then had a bit of a snooze here and tend to go to bed round about seven to eight o'clock. But this pattern of going to sleep at eight o'clock was very common and so we did a 24-hour blood pressure monitor. Now it's unfortunately turned around the wrong way so this is 12 o'clock in the daytime and 10 o'clock at night. Uh, t sorry, 10 o'clock in the morning here. So here's the night time here. So this big drop occurs at 8 o'clock and their blood pressure here goes down to 63. Now that's pretty low. Whereas their average is about 120. And then again we look at this time here where they tend to go asleep again. And here's again the drop pressure drops a lot as well, down perhaps about 65 to 70. And both of these occur at lunchtime after, the, after they've taken their medications or at breakfast after they've taken their medication. And so you might say, well, why did I think that this might be low blood pressure? Well, because the husband of this lady told me that she just goes to sleep and I can't wake her up. And um, it's not like ordinary sleep. And so we had a discussion about it and so he told me the problem was sleepiness but in fact it's low blood pressure and since I've treated the low blood pressure this has mostly gone away. So what can you do to treat low blood pressure? So mostly there, well, you start off with doing some very simple self-help things and this is something I think everybody should do um, right at the beginning. Sorry that shouldn't be there. You may need a 24-hour blood pressure monitor but that won't help you treat it. Um, but I think anyone with Parkinson's should be diligent about how much they drink each day and you should be aiming to drink somewhere between one and a half and preferably two litres of fluids a day. So that's eight glasses of something. Now I also think that um, you should try and get at least six of those glasses on board by lunchtime. And the reason being is if you wait to top up at eight o'clock at night you'll be up all night. So try and get most of it so done in the morning. So two for breakfast, two for morning tea, two for lunch, you've already done six. Um, if you do feel lightheaded, it's a good idea to drink two glasses straight down the hatch as quick as you can. We don't know why this works, but it does seem to have a reflex response on raising the blood pressure at that time. You're also one of the few people in Australia where we're going to be telling you to add salt rather than take it away. <laughs> now the reason we tell everybody else to take salt away is because salt puts your blood pressure up. Exactly what we're wanting to do here is to put your blood pressure up. So about five grams of salt is a good thing to take. If you don't know how much that is, well it's a teaspoon 
um, and you should either add it to food or if you don't like the taste of it in food, you can buy salt tablets. Many people also find that it helps to raise the foot of the bed uh, by about uh, somewhere between 30 and 50 millimetres. Just put a piece of wood underneath and lift the head of the bed up and uh, so that your head's down overnight. And that often helps to um, take away some of the, uh, drain some of the fluid away in your legs, but also helps to um, uh, le leave the fluid levels quite high in the circulation when you wake up in the morning. It may also be necessary to reduce or stop blood pressure tablets if you're on them at the same time. And the reason being is that we're now in a dilemma between trying to treat the high blood pressure or preventing the low blood pressure. We can't really stop the Parkinson's tablets, but we can stop the high blood pressure tablets. And so this ends up often with a little bit of a, um, I'll come back to the, the management of the blood pressure in a minute because it's a key point. So if an episode of low blood pressure does occur, lie down or at least sit down. Don't try and be foolhardy and um, push on through it because you'll fall over and break something. It is really important if you're lightheaded and the dizziness is coming, at least sit down. And where possible, we try and reduce the Parkinson's drugs if it's possible to do that without com compromising quality of life. And from my point of view, it's the last resource, but this is probably a tussle between the two trade unions, cardiology and neurology, and uh, so we end up often having this argument about which is the best thing to do. And at the last point, we often add this medication, one is Florinef, another one is Mestinon, and they help to retain fluid in the body. And uh, so these are the options. If we can do these ones first, that's a good thing to do. Now, about this argument between cardiologists and neurologists, it's worth thinking a little bit about what, the, what it means to have control of blood pressure and why we worry about high blood pressure. If your blood pressure is normally controlled, it sits within a band here, but you can still have peaks of high blood pressure when you're under stress or you're exercising, etc. So having high blood pressure is not abnormal, it's just abnormal to have it sitting at a high level. When people have high blood pressure, it's because it's as if the thermostat in your house is set up, the temperature's just gone up or the blood pressure's gone up, but the profile looks much the same, but it's just sitting at a higher level. Now, if we use the thermostat idea a little bit more, if you've got the heater at home, you turn the temperature up a bit, then it's going to sit there evenly at two degrees higher or whatever you turned it up to. But if the thermostat's broken, the heater doesn't know when to come on and when to come off, and it's going to be blowing away in there, and if you've got a window open, well, it depends who wins, the window or the heater, as to whether you'll be hot or cold. If the window's cold, you'll be hot, but it's going to bounce around without any control. And that's what really happens with autonomic failure, such as Parkinson's, is you have big swings in the blood pressure between being too low and too high. And so we then need to make a decision. Which is better for you in the short term and the long term to have these episodes or these episodes. Now, we treat high blood pressure because over th it means that over the next five to ten years, there is an increased risk of stroke or heart disease. Not tomorrow, but down the way. We treat low blood pressure because there's an increased risk of falls and fractures tomorrow not in five and ten years time. So we're making a trade-off there about tomorrow's problems versus the long term. Now, if we treat the blood pressure, it's just going to go up here. There will be less low bits, but there will be more high bits. You go to your GP, they measure the high bit, and they say, oh, we've got to treat it. And so they put you back on your um, micardus or whatever it is, and now the blood pressure comes again and you get the low blood pressure. So we, we always have this little bit of a battle between the neurologists and the uh, other doctors who need to treat the high blood pressure because of that. 
but this, over the short term of Parkinson's, the low blood pressure will cause far greater disability and injury than the high blood pressure. So next issue that I wanted to talk about was cognition. So what we mean by cognition when neurologists talk about it is these five domains of cognitive function we call them. There's attention and, and your ability, and I'll talk about these in more detail shortly. Planning and organisation and language, and by, I made the point there, I don't mean speech, but I mean the ability to comprehend and understand and the importance about language is that the, it's the way we have ideas and speech is just the production of sound. Memory and there are aspects of personality. And these two up here are particularly affected by Parkinson's and I'll explain why that is. Um, and when we talk about executive function, we have three parts of it, the tension, working memory and automatic functions which are all subserved by the same parts of the brain that are affected by Parkinson's disease. So if we look at the top two first of all, I want you to try taking seven from a hundred and then seven from the answer five times. Away you go. How many do you get right? Okay, I want, now you've practiced, I want you to do this again. Try and do it while you're adding those numbers up. I suspect none of you can. And that's because it takes working memory to do this. What it is, it's a process of paying attention to something and how many things can you pay attention to at the same time while you're carrying out that task. So if you're doing what we call serial sevens, you have to remember 100 from a seven is 93, now I've got to remember 93 and 100 from no, seven from 93 years, and you keep on going down, you've got to keep those things in your memory, in your working memory. Working memory allows us to hold somewhere between four and seven things in, in that space, but then when you try and fill it up with these things, there's no room left. You've exceeded your seven, so you can't actually do all of those processes. So that's what we mean by attention and working memory. Now in Parkinson's, your working memory becomes less efficient and your attention is a bit affected as well, so you have trouble at both ends. So in terms of automatic functions, I'm going to come to this as well. So the reason, the, the way the frontal lobes work is that it, it's all about what are we going to pay attention to because otherwise we'd have very big heads if we were allowed to pay attention to more things. And so if, we're going, if we can only pay attention to a small number of things, we need automatic processes working underneath to help us carry out those tasks. So the reason you learn your times tables is so that you don't have to go into the shop and say, oh, there's four items at uh, three cents, so that's one, two, three, four, five, six. Work it out. You just automatically go, three times four is 12, so that'll be, so you've got that automatically learnt. The reason I've got this car up here is I want you to think about when you learnt to drive. Your attention and your working memory was all directed towards the clutch and the gears and the brakes, and you couldn't pay attention to who was in front of you or what you're bumping into or where you were going. And once that becomes automatic, that's the dopamine part of the brain, makes it automatic, then you can attend to where you're going to go and what you're going to do. So if the automatic components which are done managed by dopamine are not working so well, then a lot more of your working memory has to be given to giving up those tasks so you're not as efficient at actually solving problems and working things out. We also know that the dopamine part of the brain actually keeps the working memory better organised and so it's more efficient. So the sorts of things that this balance between automatic functions and working memory means is that it's the ability to persist at the task, you stand in a queue because you know what the reward will be so you can actually say, I won't respond to that impulse to run off because I'm sick of it, I'll just hang on here because I've got to get the money. 
and it allows you to talk on your phone and put the lipstick on while you're driving the car because your working memory is big enough to do all of these tasks at once and not do other things automatically. But if it's not working well, then you're impersistent and impulsive and relatively easy di easily distracted and less able to carry out tasks. And so from the onset of Parkinson's, before it's diagnosed, there is a decline in some of these functions. So actually I've said all of those things, but in just to reiterate, when, the, when that process is working poorly, impulsivity, and we talked about the effect of impulsivity on, on falls, people are more likely to respond to the doorbell because it rang and I've got to go, rather than thinking, actually, I can't go, I've got to wait and get my stick and get myself organised and get up there, and, but that's the process that's required. Perseverative behaviour, that is a tendency to keep on doing what you're doing even though there's something else more pressing that needs to be attended to. And often there's a more uh, complex pathology there as well. And all of these things together lead to difficulty in working out how to solve a problem. You can see that all of the facts are there in front of you, but it just doesn't make sense. And I often describe my own experience, because this can happen to all of us, but flying from Australia to Charles de Gaulle Airport. The plane was late and I had to catch a flight and the gap between being able to get to my flight and get off my flight, uh, Australian flight to the new one was getting worryingly short. I speak no French and signs in Charles de Gaulle are not in English and um, it was very hard for me to figure out where I had to get to and I got more and more anxious and more and more flustered. When I finally got there and thought about what I'd done, I realised that this was not my finest performance in working out a problem. <laughs> and um, I could have actually solved it much easier, but the problem was that anxiety, tiredness, and uh, being a bit confused about the circumstances, not being able to call on automaticity, had eroded my working memory, and so I wasn't as good at problem solving. So what can you do? Well you can reduce complexity. Try not to go to Charles de Gaulle. Um, <laughs> but try to do things in smaller chunks rather than actually go at the speed you went to before. So people often who've had problems with working memory because of illness often find, say for example, family gatherings when all 50 turn up and lots going on and the kids are running everywhere is much worse than actually talking to two or three people quietly because it's less complex and less going on. Depression is a very important component that can erode what, working memory, what parts of working memory are working well enough. So it's important to take mental health steps to improve depression if, if it's present. Now, again, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about what I mean by depression, although I'm happy to have a bit of a chat about that afterwards in question time if there's some discussion about that. But we don't just mean sadness here, but we mean social withdrawal, lack of interest and lack of drive about engagement as well as this component of sadness. And often, particularly in men, but in older people, depression manifests as withdrawal and lack of enthusiasm and with an element of um, sometimes apathy as well. And these are things that can actually be addressed by taking steps to re-engage to improve sleep patterns where possible, and if necessary, consider antidepressants. Reducing anxiety is less easily done, but it's a very common component of this decline in working memory. Improving sleep is important. If there's dyskinesia, it's important to try and reduce it because not that the dyskinesia causes it, but it's a fellow traveler. Anxiety comes when the dopamine levels are rising and falling in the brain a lot, and so high levels of dopamine producing the dyskinesia also produce anxiety when they fall again. And so if we can smooth out the dyskinesia, we often reduce the amount of anxiety. There are also medications which are helpful for this, and I'm going to talk about them later in another setting of cognitive function, but when, they be, when, when anxiety and uh, particularly becomes overwhelming, we often need to resort to them. So 
we've alluded to the way in which most people with Parkinson's will have some effect on their attention and planning. But there's a spectrum which occurs from people who have normal function in all of these domains in people who have what's called mild cognitive impairment which is that it's perhaps not flash but it doesn't really get in the way of ordinary social functioning and that's reasonably common in Parkinson's but not by any means universal and then there's frank dementia which occurs in Parkinson's and when the dementia of Parkinson's has this flavour where it's mostly about a problem of attention and planning. And the reason we, you can see here that this is a continuum, so there's no dotted line here that says that's dementia. But it's really more that when it gets to a certain stage where it's truly interfering with your ability to function that we actually call it so. The other thing is that people very often think that dementia is only Alzheimer's disease. But we regard really three out of these five, doesn't matter which one, is a form of dementia and it's just that language and memory with Alzheimer's is the most common form of dementia but it's not the only form of dementia. Now, at some stage in Parkinson's this will be usual. It's not imperative but it's usual. The executive type which I spoke about, which is the um, problems with uh, um, organising and managing and uh, 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 problem solving and related to working memory, I probably should say common rather than often in late stage Parkinson's. But, and the Alzheimer's type disease often occurs together with this in about 10 to 15 percent of cases. And we it's increasingly becoming evident that the, one of the proteins which we think misbehaves in uh, Parkinson's called alpha-synuclein in some way enables misbehaviour of the types of proteins that misbehave in Alzheimer's, particularly the um, A-beta protein. And so when the two are together, one enables the other to occur, which is why we think this second type is more common. The other is that in the age group of people who are often uh, in the later stages of Parkinson's, Alzheimer's is often quite common anyway. Now there's another type of dementia which is called dementia with Lewy bodies. Now it's the second most type of dementia that occurs on its own. And there's a big debate in the Parkinson's community as to whether this is truly a separate condition or whether in fact it's a type of Parkinson's and that whether the involvement of these things called Lewy bodies, which are the accumulation of that protein that I called alpha-synuclein, normally these occur in the lower part of the brain early on and only reach the upper surface of the brain after many years, which is when this uh, executive type dementia that occurs with Lewy bodies occurs. But we think that there might be a subgroup of people in whom these Lewy bodies go to the surface immediately and so the same type of dementia occurs. But we find it difficult to distinguish the dementia of Lewy bodies and Parkinson's except that what we call dementia with Lewy bodies occurs early whereas we call it Parkinson's dementia if it occurs late. And that's really, that would be my view, although, as I said, it's a hotly debated area in Parkinson's research and there's as many people who will disagree with me on that and say, no, no, it's truly a different entity. So, of the list of things we've talked about, postural instability and dementia, and we've also talked about autonomic failure, but there's this other aspect of uh, dementia with Lewy bodies and with Parkinson's which introduces hallucinations. Um, and I'm not sure why that's there. So what do we mean by hallucinations? So 
there's a whole world of interest around hallucinations away from Parkinson. I'm going to touch very briefly on them first to put this in context. So the, the normal human brain is a confabulator. It makes up stories about the environment we live in all the time. And there's some reason to think that we also, so I'll just go back, and we also know that, for example, most of you have had pins and needles. But, and you'll swear that there's something tickling on your fingers. But there's nothing on your fingers, and we know it, it's common enough that we say, oh, well, that must be because my arm has gone to sleep. But actually, it's a type of hallucinatory process because you think there's something on your fingers, but it's not actually there. And that's because the receiving area up here in the brain is getting <coughs> mixed up signals so it makes up a story about what's going on and said, oh, that must be coming up. I reckon you've got something on your fingers. It might be a crawling ant or something or other down there. And so similarly, if we get um, hear doorbells, I would think that almost everyone has had the experience that they reckon they've heard something outside, they've gone outside to look, nothing's there, so you say, oh, it must have been the kids next door. We make up a story. But many, many psychologists and psychiatrists think that it's normal for us to actually hear, see or feel things that are not really there because our brain makes it up. So what we're really talking about when we say hallucinations is not that it's abnormal, but it's abnormally prevalent and it causes worry and anxiety. Now, in Parkinson's, the hallucinations are unusual because they are typically visual. In many other conditions, auditory hallucinations are much more com common. People hear things or hear voices, but in Parkinson's, people tend to see people, occasionally see little flashing objects or animals or other unformed things, but it's visual and very rarely do they actually hear anything. So how does this process begin? Well, it's quite common for people to have nightmares with Parkinson's because the dopamine controls the sleep pattern and people wake up during their sleep state, their what we call rapid eye movement sleep stage because the dopamine can't keep the... Actually, I've not properly explained that. I'm going to go back again. When you go to sleep, your moving part of the brain is disconnected from the thinking and dreaming part of the, the thinking and memory part of the brain. And most of you have seen children who sleepwalk. That's an example where the connection comes on. Many of you, probably I would think uh, perhaps 10 or 15 people in this room this size have probably had the experience of waking up and not being able to move for about a minute or so. And that's where the reconnection hasn't come on in time. Now, this disconnection between the moving and the thinking part of the brain is at its strongest when we're dreaming, which is when our eyes are moving rapidly backwards and forwards. And if we wake someone up at that stage, they can remember their dreams well, but otherwise they'll sleep through and may not even know they've had a dream. Now, in some way, dopamine is very much involved in making this disconnection and reconnecting it. So something happens with Parkinson's which means that this reconnection is more likely to occur and it often occurs during the middle of the dreaming phase so people murmur and call out in their sleep, which we call REM behaviour disorder, which is common in about... Um, 25% of males with Parkinson's before it's diagnosed. And then it goes on to waking up in the hallucinations and where people complain that they've just had a nightmare. And mostly in the early stages, people are aware that they've had a nightmare. But even most of you, again, will have at some stage or other had a nightmare and had, it's a minute or two before you've been able to figure out that that really was. You're sort of still sweaty and all the rest of it. And so these continue in a group of people, particularly in later in the illness, to persist after waking 
and so that there's still some confusion around whether the, the dream is real or not real and over a period of time, usually turning on the lights, everything settles down and can go back to sleep. Often these are then develop into what are called waking hallucinations in which people see either a little flash of something going by or sometimes see people in the room. Very often they will know that they're hallucinations. They're not troubled by them. They're aware that this aren't real, that there's those, the people are there. And then they develop, and this is not an obligatory path, many people have nightmares and never develop these things, but I'm saying that there's a progression that people who get to here usually start it up there. And at some stage along the way, these hallucinations become troublesome and become real and produce what, what we call a delirium with a psychotic flavour to them. So, as I mentioned before, these ones up here are predominantly what are called rapid eye movement or REM sleep problems. And these I've talked before are brief shadows and people talking. And we, can, we know that many of these are made worse by the medications for Parkinson's, a concurrent infection, particularly a urinary tract infection, poor sleep, and other stresses, so for example, sleeping in a different place or uh, disturbs, uh, this is a very typical problem where someone has to go to hospital because they've had a fall, so they've got a physiological stressor, they're not sleeping well because nurses always bang the bedpans at two in the morning and they're in a strange place and then people who've never had these problems start having hallucinations or might develop a mild delirium. So what can we do? So there are medications which will help these problems of REM sleep disorders, but we have to remember who are we treating because the person who complains most about REM sleep disorder is the bed partner. So we're in this interesting situation where we're telling, we're going to prescribe a drug to this person to treat that person. <laughs> so we then have to say, why are you worried? And very often it's because it, the talking and the streaming distresses them. It's not actually the sleep. And if you spend a bit of time explaining what's going on, you can go a long way to actually not necessarily needing the medications. But at other times, sleep is so disrupted that everyone's tired that you do need to, report to re resort to some of these medications. Once the waking hallucinations occur, the first thing we usually do is reduce the Parkinson's medications as much as possible. And again, we come to a compromise here is because we're trading off mobility for a more calmer life, and this is a difficult problem. If necessary, we can use these drugs called quetiapine, which is an atypical antipsychotic, or Aricept, which is a drug that is used for memory in Alzheimer's, but we're using it for a different reason here. And these drugs are both useful because they reduce anxiety. And I mentioned before about ways we can treat anxiety, and I was referring to these two drugs. And I'll come back to the reason why they are important, but particularly when there's any delirium, anxiety is often a big driver in that process, and so by treating the anxiety, we actually go a long way to managing the rest of the problems. If someone has been stable, and that is that they haven't really had a delirium and they suddenly develop it, we almost always will find an infection as the cause of it. And again, treating that rapidly will reduce the length of time that the delirium will persist. And that usually has to be managed by reducing the medications, PD medications, in quite dramatically and increasing these drugs for the time being. So I wanted to talk a little bit about this condition we call delirium because um, it, in stage Parkinson's it does occur both as a temporary condition or as a chronic condition. And it's characterised by impaired attention, we've talked about that, broadly impaired condition in many domains, changed behaviour, typically people are hyperactive but they come, can become hyper underactive and withdraw and there's a tendency for this to fluctuate. So it's bad overnight 
and then they don't know, have no memory of what they did overnight, even though it might have been, you know, going through the kitchen or walking outside or trying to find the intruder, and they have no recollection of those events. They can also be acute, and that is someone who's had an absolutely clear sensorium, none of this, and then in a setting of infection or of trauma, it comes on, and we talked about that before. It can be chronic, and that means that we are then having to manage the trade-off between mobility and the anti-Parkinson's drugs versus treating the anxiety, the delirium. So I'm nearly finished now, and I just want to briefly talk on a difficult issue, which is end-of-life issues. So I think that this is an important thing that everybody with Parkinson's should discuss about what they think or should happen here. And particularly <coughs> if you're at the stage where falls or some of these other factors are beginning to occur. And it's best if you discuss it openly and or, t or cajole, force or harass your neurologist into talking <coughs> about it with you. And the decisions are easier with planning. Now, there's often some confusion about what we mean by end-of-life issues, and people say, oh, well, I don't want to be put on a ventilator. This is uncommon with Parkinson's, that you would be put into ICU or on a ventilator. What's much more common to happen is that those infections I talked about start to become more frequent. And usually at that stage, you have some choices, because they fall into these simple categories, is that if you treat the infection, will you survive or not survive? Clearly, if, sorry, if you don't treat the infection, would you survive or not survive? So if, you, if you're going to survive, then clearly you should get on and treat it and make it better. So that's the question you should ask the treating doctor in accident emergency. What will happen if we don't treat? And if the doctor says, oh well, I'll survive but it'll take longer, get on and treat it. If on the other hand they said, well, unlikely that someone's going to survive this, then you're in a position, if you've made plans, to tell the doctor what to do. If you've made no plans, the doctor will not respond to that because they don't believe you've thought this through. So it's that sort of discussion that I think you, everyone should have and understand what they want to do. So. I know that's a gloomy note, but um, I think it's a very important aspect of Parkinson's. So I'll now move on to a shameless plug. Uh, if you're interested in joining the Australian Parkinson's Disease Registry, it's a, um, this is a research registry, so if you participate in this, um, we'd like, um, it involves a formalised examination and uh, some of your blood and a willingness to be on the register to participate in other forms of research. Sarah, who some of you may know, has just gone on maternity leave, so if you use that number and Amanda's filling in for her um, for the time being. So I think we have a few minutes for questions, if anyone would like to ask. <coughs>